Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Shaheen Rothermel. I'm a partner in Venables Advertising Group. I'm joined by my partner, Ellen Birch, who is also a partner at Venables Advertising Group. Uh, and today's topic is telemarketing and texting 2.0, a regulatory refresher and federal and state updates. We have a lot to get through, so we really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and will be available at venable.com. We'll do our best to get to your questions during the webinar. If we cannot, we will respond to them afterwards and the slides will be available afterwards as well. Okay, so I'll get it started. Um, here's a little overview of our agenda today. We um, want to start with a, a really refresher of the, of the laws that have governed telemarketing and texting programs for many years now, ones that you all think about day to day, ones that we work on um, with many of you and, and, and that companies think about, um, always get a level set there. Um, but there is a trend um, in the states that um, is um, coming up with new state laws that impact telemarketing and texting. And there's some reasons for that rooted in some developments in the federal law. So we'll, we'll, we'll catch you up there. Um, we'll talk about the regulatory trends in that, in that aspect. Um, recent litigation and examples so that you can use that to gauge some of your uh, compliance efforts and, and thinking on these issues. And then we will uh, talk about some ways to reduce risk. So, all right. So here's our, our first sort of refresher slide. And this will give you a little bit of a snapshot. Um, under federal law, there are really two regimes that govern telemarketing um, and texting types of programs. Um, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act or the TCPA is one we speak of frequently. Um, you might hear people say uh, TCPA compliance or a TCPA lawsuit or whatever it is, but um, this is really stemming from laws that are enforced by the Federal Communications Commission, um, which has implemented rules, of course, to govern things that occur over the phone. Uh, the, the phone is the, the mechanism there. And the TCPA was written with a private enforcement um, right of action within it. And so um, that is why we, we very much consider it frequently in our compliance efforts, because it's not just an FCC enforcement risk, it is a private action and, and more so a class action type of uh, venue there for our plaintiff's attorneys on the telemarketing texting front. So um, a key thing there, the TCPA is mostly um, or primarily just an outbound calling type of law, but there's a lot to it. Um, there are consent requirements within it, um, consent requirements for um, calling and texting cell phones and other types of lines. There's other, other things in it like uh, requirements to transmit caller ID information, which sometimes can get a little bit complicated. Um, there's some other things in there relating to fax ads and, um, and some nuanced things about maintaining written compliance policies. Um, and of course, um, it's not just consent for calling under the TCPA. It's, it's, the do not call requirements that have been around now for a long time. So as you all are probably familiar with, um, we have a national do not call list. It is um, managed jointly by the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission, which we'll talk about in a second. But of course, people can put their phone numbers on the national do not call list if they do not want to receive calls. You can put a cell phone number on the DNC list and it, and it is supposed to um, ward off uh, telemarketers from, from sending cold calls your way. There are, there are exceptions to that. For example, if you have an existing business relationship with the company that's calling or you've given them consent, they can still call you. But the, the do not call rules have been very important uh, in this, in this uh, country for a while. So then on the other side, the telemarketing sales rule that's enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. There's really no practical private law enforcement avenue there. So we don't see um, the, the class action lawsuits um, on this zone of things. Um, but we do see a lot of active FTC enforcement um, because there are lots of different things in the TSR um, that are different from what the F, um, than what the FCC has. There's a lot of disclosure requirements for uh, things like negative options and subscription marketing. Um, there's a um, very specific pr provisions in the TSR for certain types of sort of higher risk products and services, debt relief services being one of them. Um, there's um, provisions in the TSR that prohibit somebody from assisting and facilitating another party who is violating the TSR's requirements. And that is a provision that um, encapsulates a lot of lead generators. It could encapsulate a fulfillment house or a payment processor. So, um, so really some of those differences there on the, 
on the FTC side are, are notable there, but that, that is our lay of the land on the federal. Um, the state laws is another, um, sometimes even more complex because as state laws typically are, they do vary widely among the states. Um, while many states have subscribed and have made the national do not call list their own, there are still some states that maintain their own state specific do not call list. So to the extent sort of cold calling and needing to scrub against do not call list is your thing, um, you've got to make sure you've been captured those, uh, those state laws too. And then um, um, there's the other big thing with the states is registration. So we are frequently doing exercises here to sort of determine whether a state's telemarketing registration requirement, which is in more than half of the states, um, might apply to your calling programs. And that's looking at all the different exemptions in the states. Will they apply, for example, to if you're only calling your, your past purchasers or people who have asked to be called, or um, if you're a publicly traded company, maybe you're exempt, but it's a really fact-specific nuanced sort of analysis on, on registration that, that really must be done because we do know that, that states will enforce their registration requirements um, if, if, if they feel like they need to. Um, states also have some consent requirements that, um, that come into play. Um, some states have disclosure and scripting requirements. Um, so what needs to be said at the beginning of a call? Do you have to say who you are, who you're calling on behalf of? Do you have to say um, upfront the purpose of your call or, or, or do you have to make other sorts of disclosures? And then, and again, this can also vary from state to state. So a little bit of a sort of a compliance matrix or a big chart is often useful here. Um, the no rebuttal rule in the states is if, if you call somebody and, and they say, don't call me, you have to end the call there. You can't sort of rebut their objection to it. So um, calling time restrictions come up in the state laws, also in federal law, but they, they may differ. Um, some states have requirements to keep written policies on what you're doing with the, um, with the calling. And then, of course, um, we think frequently about um, recording and monitoring phone calls. The privacy laws come in, into play there. So you can see there's, there's a lot going on. Um, if you want to engage in, in telephone marketing and texting, there's just a lot to, to consider. And you really have to be careful to have a robust program. Okay, so more on our refresher here. This is really gonna to get to the heart of what we're gonna spend most of the time talking about today. But um, you know, for the longest time now, our concern has been really rooted in the TCPA consent rules, which have said uh, that if you're going to use an automated dialing system or an auto dialer um, or the robocall, which is a pre-recorded voice message, but leaving leaving those aside because um, the auto dialer is sort of more more pressing here. But if you're going to use an auto dialer to call or text a cell phone number, um, then you need uh, consent. And so there's two different levels of consent. Um, if your call is um, informational only. Um, Hey, your uh, your reminder of your doctor's appointment next week. Um, your your car is ready for pickup from the repair shop. Um, school is closed. All of those types of sort of informational, non-marketing types of automated calls and texts um, are subject to prior express consent, which actually hasn't been defined um, by the TCPA. But over time, um, it's been a, it's a pretty loose standard, um, I would say. Or you, you don't need check boxes and, and, and very specific things, but you know, the more you do, obviously, the more it is helpful to prove it because it is your responsibility to prove that you got consent. Um, but it really can be verbal or written, but probably harder to prove verbal than, than in writing. Um, but um, you know, there, are, there, are, there has been case law over the years that say, for example, if, if you collect somebody's cell phone number in the course of a transaction and you need to reach them about that transaction, um, that provision of, of their number in that transaction uh, may be sufficient for consent. And you can see how these, these facts might, have, might turn uh, sort of, uh, could be subject to a different view, differing views and, the, and they always are, so you have to be careful there. But again, that is the prior express consent side really for purely informational calls, not a marketing purpose. Um, a marketing purpose that would be there is a, um, you text somebody because their loyalty program points are going to expire. Um, we would put that over on the left side here um, because you're trying to get somebody to come in, come back to the store, buy something, use their points, 
um, that's going to shift over. So you do have to be careful about um, how these uh, sort of buckets work. But on the marketing side of things, if it's a if it's a message or a call for a commercial purpose of any kind, um, you do need prior express written consent. This is sort of the newer um, definition that's been written in. It's not new, but it's you know it's 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 evolved from prior express consent for marketing calls. Um, that has to be evidenced by an agreement that is signed. Um, we, um, it seems to be that a checkbox or other sort of sort of authorization or authentication or, or a, 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 some expression of some willingness to do something um, would count as an electronic signature, but it, it does need to be there. Um, it's got to authorize a very specific company to make marketing uh, calls or messages to the consumer. Um, it's, this consent has to reference the telephone number to which the consumer is saying it's okay to make these calls. And then it has to include a couple of really specific disclosures. The first that the call or text must be made using an auto dialer. So always kind of awkward or, or was at least at first is to say, we're gonna call you using an automated dialing system. Um, and you also have to disclose that um, the consumer is not required to provide consent as a condition of making a purchase. And that was also sometimes an awkward one because a lot of times you're collecting consent in a situation that is not involving a purchase at all. Um, but nonetheless, those are technical requirements. So we've been working with those for years. Lots of, um, I think we can go on, lots of sort of lawsuits around those and whether there's been adequate compliance. But, um, and, and a lot of this was sort of rooted in, as I said, this whole question about what is an auto dialer. And we have the definition up there. Um, it was written uh, and um, like, I think in 1991 was the year and it was sort of not, it was written with what we knew and what we had in 1991, but it was sort of this dialing equipment that was um, used to um, store produced telephone numbers to be called using a random or sequential number generator and then actually dial such numbers. So um, that was, that then became the subject of a lot of other court cases. And there was all sorts of discussion about okay, well, if you have somebody pressing a button, the number might pull up on an automated system or a CRM system, but if I have a human that will hit a ball, a button, a click to call type of thing, um, is that an auto dialer or, or not? And um, what if my CRM just stores phone numbers, but it doesn't dial them or, or whatever it may be. So um, um, all sorts of different ways to look at this and, and cases were kind of going back and forth for years and really sort of the success of a defendant's um, defense of a TCPA claim would sometimes depend on how a particular court was gonna view their situation and where they were. But um, after all this, let's go to the next slide. Um, there was um, a sort of some, some settlement of all of these questions in a certain way with a Supreme Court decision a couple of years ago now um, in this do good case um, where in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court read that definition of auto dollar very, very literally. Um, and said, you know, you can't sort of interpret this broadly and it really means sort of just any sort of computerized dialing system. It's really got to be um, a device that has the capacity to store numbers using a random or sequential generator um, or to produce a telephone number using a random or sequential number generator. So it could have been like making them numbers or, or literally starting at the beginning of the phone book and dialing them sequentially. So a really much narrower reading of auto dialer there. Um, what happened after that is that um, TCPA case has really changed because um, the, 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 uh, the allegation that an auto dialer was used was really subject to a different view now. Um, so we did see um, sort of a little bit of a, de of a decline there, but we, you know, the class action plaintiffs could dip into other things. Maybe now it's time to re-raise all of these do not call types of things. And under the TCPA, a do not call violation is also subject to private litigation. So there were still sort of things to use there and, and still are. Um, and we saw some other um, more lawsuits challenging sort of that pre-recorded message prong um, which really wasn't affected by the auto dialer uh, decision here because pre-recorded messages are pre-recorded messages. So, um, and then the other effect of it was um, state laws kind of cropping up and we're, and we're continuing to crop there, you know, now they're still kind of popping up. And I think that's what, where we will head next is the state law. So just a little bit more um, here for me, then I'll turn over to Shaheen, but um, the first one that really became impactful was Florida. Florida had for a long time 
a um, the Florida Telephone Solicitation Act since 1990, but it didn't have a private cause of action. So um, in July of 2021, there were amendments passed, which gave Florida a private sort of cause of action around it. Um, and then we saw literally hundreds of cases filed um, right after that. And um, there, the uh, Florida definition of an automated system was written a lot more broadly. So it was just an automated system for the selection or dialing. So think here very basically a system, you're, you're like anything dials. I mean, anything your cell phone dials, I mean, anything, your regular landline phone to the extent you have one still dials. So, um, so really broad there. Um, and then there are all sorts of questions about, you know, is this really what this means? There were questions because it's a, a Florida law. There are questions about, okay, well, what if I used to live in Florida 10 years ago when I got my cell phone number, but now I live in Washington, DC, am I still covered by the Florida law or not? Or I'm not physically in Florida. So, you know, all sorts of um, issues there and, and class action lawsuits and lots of busyness there. Um, and so we, you know, since I guess 20, for a couple of years, right, we were dealing with this, but now, um, Florida law, I think we say has really kind of been gutted. Um, it's no longer, um, has the impact and effect that it, it, it once did because of really recent amendments that were signed into law by the Florida governor. So, and those amendments, the auto dialer definition has been, um, scaled back in a certain way that it's a dialing system that both can select and dial um, or play recorded messages, um, um, further narrowing. It can only, it's only gonna apply to unsolicited sales calls. Um, for example, um, it loosened the signature requirement and, and, and made it clear that you can just use a, a, um, a checkbox or some sort of email, like somebody saying it's okay. It didn't have to be like this whole signature concept. Um, and there was also this important safe harbor. So, um, which is actually kind of a cool thing that, that we like, but um, somebody can't sue over this unless they've um, responded at least to that first text and said, stop. So, uh, and, then, and then there's a violation um, you know, after that. So it puts a little bit more on the consumer to use these stop functions, which is a lot of how email works, but um, a lot of how we're used to engaging now. I think people are used to sort of using the stop functions, but um, Florida law has incorporated in that. And then the other nice thing is that it sort of blew out old cases or, or existing cases too, because the amendments are retroactive. So I don't know if you want to add anything more about Florida, but. No, I think that that's exactly right. I mean, the, the safe Harbor provision for text messages is pretty massive and it's aligned with what really in my mind should be the answer, because if somebody's getting a text message that they don't want to receive, it's often very simple to just respond with a stop. Uh, and what we saw in Florida as well as under the TCPA is that, People don't respond with stop, but instead they file a putative class action seeking millions and millions of dollars of damages. And then as a company or an organization, you're stuck in court defending that. So it can be very, very nuisance in a way that could be resolved very early on by somebody simply asking you to stop and you providing a good stop mechanism. Having said that, you always should have some uh, a stop mechanism on your whenever you have text message um, marketing, and you should be able to honor all different types of ways that people would ask to opt out. So after this Florida um, amendment was signed into law and before, we've seen a number of state laws cropping up, as Ellen said, and those laws have a lot of different requirements in them. But one thing that we're seeing a lot of is the private right of action, the expanding the private right of action. And the reason that this is important is because it allows plaintiffs in specific states to take advantage of the technical opportunities in those state laws that might not be offered under the uh, Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Before I get into the specific state laws, I'll give an example. A, a lot of these state laws will deal with do not call requirements. So the states will say, that you must follow, uh, you must not call anybody on our state's do not call list. And that includes the federal do not call list that Ellen was talking about earlier, where people can register their telephone numbers with the FTC. There is a massive do not call list and um, companies are not permitted to call uh, telephone numbers on that list without specific exemptions. The issue under the federal TCPA that class action plaintiffs have run into is this procedural issue, which is that 
for a private right of action to exist under a do not call violation, a complainant has to receive more than one violating call or text uh, within a, a 12 month period. And so the way that we've always thought about it is you get one free bite at the apple, for lack of a better word. But now that you have state laws cropping up here, it now provides, um, you know, it technically it doubles liability now for those for those two calls or it really infinitely does, but there was no liability and now there is. But the idea is that class action plaintiffs are going to use these to find avenues to uh, file on a state by state basis. And um, so I'll go through some of them and then we'll talk about the litigation and what we're seeing in terms of enforcement as well. The first uh, really big one that that Ellen and I have been talking about will take effect in January of 24, and that's Maryland's law, Stop the Spam Calls Act. That's going to require prior express written consent for any pre-recorded or automated marketing call made using an automated system for the selection or dialing of telephone numbers. Now, what that means is that Maryland has adopted this very broad language concerning the technology that a company is using to make a phone call. An automated system for the selection or dialing of telephone numbers, to me, could mean anything. That's, that's incredibly broad. That also tracks the Florida statute that Ellen was talking about a few minutes ago that started a wave of class action lawsuits. We saw hundreds of demands. It was, it was incredible. And one of the reasons we saw so many of those demands is because the language here is so broad. If any type of telephone could be an automated system for the selection or dialing of telephone numbers, then any marketing call or text message automatically presents some risk. The problem, too, is that Florida's law also tracked this language, and we didn't really see a court come out in any type of adjudication of what does automated system for selection or dialing of telephone numbers. I would say we lucked out back in 2021 when the Supreme Court explained this is what the Telephone Consumer Protection Act's um, definition of ATDS means. And so that really narrowed it and thereby narrowed the liability. And now you have states like Maryland that are coming in and expanding the liability. I suspect that that technology that triggers liability is going to end up somewhere in the middle, but we're in this weird no man's land right now where, uh, where statutes like Maryland's are, are cropping up. The Oklahoma Telephone Solicitation Act, or OTSA, is also patterned after Florida's law. It also adopts Florida's uh, auto dialer definition, and it also adopts the presumption that Ellen was talking about, that if somebody has an Oklahoma area code, even if they're hanging out in California and you call or text them, there's a rebuttable presumption that that person is an Oklahoma resident and therefore they have a cause of action to sue you under the Oklahoma Telephone Solicitation Act. There's one crucial difference between Oklahoma and Florida's law that we think is really going to help companies and we think makes sense for that matter, is that Oklahoma's law specifically exempts people who are soliciting business from prospective consumers who have an existing business relationship or EDR with that company or who have previously purchased from the business enterprise for which the solicitor is calling or if the solicitor is operating under the same uh, business enterprise. What that means then is that we don't have to go through all of these hoops for prior express written consent. What a lot of industry commenters are saying is that this exemption is really just going to read out the ultimate consent requirement. Because if somebody has a business relationship or arises specifically from somebody who has some sort of touch point inquiry or prior purchase from the, co the company, then you don't really need to go through all the check boxes that Ellen was talking about earlier. Washington's Robocall Spam uh, Protection Act has a restriction on automatic dialing and announcing devices. Again, this goes back to what type of technology is being used to transmit the communication. And this is uh, an automatic dialing and announcing device, and that has two parts to it. It's a system which automatically dials telephone numbers and transmits a recorded or artificial voice message once that connection is made, including if the message goes directly to a recipient's voicemail. A lot going on there, let's unpack it. The first is that it needs to not only be sent using that automatic dialing system, but also needs to be transmitting a pre-recorded message. 
The second piece of this is that it includes messages that go directly to the recipient's voicemail. So that includes ringless voicemail drops. I think that that is uh, consistent with what we've seen alleged in the TCPA side. So what is a pre-recorded call? A ringless voicemail drop, we see class action plaintiffs say, yeah, that's a, that's a pre-recorded call. Commercial solicitations are defined as the unsolicited initiation of a telephone communication made for the purpose of encouraging someone to purchase property, goods, or services. Um, now, that, that's pretty standard. What, what this is important, though, is to, to note is that commercial solicitations on the state law side are typically defined as unsolicited communications. So when we're looking at these state laws, we're we really are tangling through a, a web. It's something has gotten very tangled and we're going through string by string by string. And I say that to mean that unsolicited initiation of telephone communication, the question then becomes what is solicited? Does solicited mean that I ask for the call? Does it mean that I sign up on a web form and the web form has magic language such as you by signing up, you allow me, to, um, you understand that you'll get uh, calls made using an automatic dialing and announcing device. So, so that's really the open question here, not necessarily with the Washington law only, but with all of these laws when we're looking at how legislators are, are drafting them because they're not necessarily drafting them consistently with what we've seen uh, in the past on the federal level. Additional restrictions on the Washington side are telephone solicitations to phone numbers on the national do not call registry and knowingly causing any caller ID service to transmit misleading, inaccurate, or false caller identification information. One thing that I would say we're seeing as a trend is this requirement for both affirmative disclosures of who you are, who you're calling on behalf of, how to call you back, where you are, as well as, well as uh, prohibiting any type of misrepresentations that uh, a telemarketer might make on the phone call. So before we'll go on to some more state laws, but I want to give you guys a CLE code and that is telemarketing 2023, telemarketing 2023. Let's continue with some, some interesting state law developments. New York is an example of a law that goes to what we were just talking about, which is that you must inform the customer if the telemarketing call is made by a natural person that he or she may request that his or telephone number may be added to the entity specific do not call list. And this has to happen at the beginning of the call. So this gets really awkward and unwieldy. And we recommend taking a look at your, your outbound calling scripts to see what those, what those look like, because you're really gonna have to find a way to naturally and organically insert in there that, hey, this is Shaheen calling on behalf of ABC store. By the way, if you want to add your number to our do not call list, you, know, you can do that. And then you need to honor that request. There's ways to do it, obviously. I'm being a little bit silly, but um, th those are things to think about how to incorporate those into a script, both in line with your relationship with the, with the recipient, the type of product that you're selling, and whether or not this is an ongoing relationship or if you're selling something specific. And you also have to add in, um, if you're recording the call, a notice of call recording in most places anyway. So it gets, there's a lot that has to be set up from before you even get to the gist of what you're calling. And so it's, 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 it's difficult. It's a different call to exercise to do that. And that's a great point. And so we, we've talked about this internally too, is that if you want to have proof of your consent or proof of your mm -hmm. compliance under New York law, for example, you have to... It, it's going to be hard. Maybe you have scripts. We've, we've used scripts and we've just used declarations and policies and auditing, for example, to show that there's compliance. But at the end of the day, a really good way to prove compliance is producing the call recordings. Yes. To get the call recordings, though, in many of these states, you have to provide, um, a, you have to say, hey, this call is being recorded so that they, they consent if it's a, um, a two-party consent uh, state. And then you've got everything else you've said about the offer sort of on the table too, but just, you Which, know, the yeah. disclosure. So. Yeah. So it's, and, and then the same, the same things really apply here. So negative option offers, like Ellen was talking about with the TSR, the telemarketer has to specifically disclose things like the recurring charges, what somebody's going to be buying, how frequently they're going to be paying for it and how to cancel. Um, the other thing here, uh, maybe not necessarily explicit under New York's telemarketing statute here is that a lot of these laws also prohibit misrepresentations over the phone call, the phone. And if you think about that, that it makes it really easy for somebody to challenge an advertising claim under a technical state statute. We see this very frequently in California. Um, 
I, I think it might be a little bit more difficult, but I wouldn't put anything past anybody these days. Mm -hmm. New Jersey also requires callers to identify themselves at the outset of the call. And they're also required to um, provide a mailing address and identity on their website. Uh, that New Jersey law is gonna take effect in, in December. Georgia also uh, prohibits calling telephone numbers or making marketing calls to telephone numbers on its do not call list. What's important to know about Georgia law is that it now expands liability. So it creates liability for both telemarketers and third-party contractors. So what we had seen in the past is that there's really a question of who is liable under a specific law. Is it the entity that's actually dialing the telephone number and speaking with the customer or sending the text messages? Is it the entity on whose behalf those calls are being made? If you're using an ad agency or an affiliate network, or a, even a lead generator, if there's something sort of passing along there, are those people liable? In the past, we've seen plaintiff's attorneys say, well, they're all liable. And we think that Georgia is trying to open the door a little bit for, for plaintiff's attorneys to jump in there and make more arguments. Whether or not they're successful is yet mm -hmm. to be seen. So let's talk about regulatory trends. The Federal Communications Commission has been incredibly busy in the TCPA, in TCPA area. The first one is that it has issued a notice of proposed rulemaking uh, that would close the lead generator loophole. We, a ton of companies use lead, lead generators to get consent for their, um, you know, for their to make any outbound calls, to promote their pro products, and they, they do it because it's oftentimes easier. Um, what the FCC is saying is that they don't want lead generators, or if, if adopted in its current form, the FCC's proposal would um, prohibit lead generators from obtaining consumers' consent to call multiple different companies about multiple different things. The whole purpose of this closing the lead generator loophole NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, is to prevent instances where you have um, a, a web page that sells one thing or that promotes one thing, get your auto insurance quote, and somebody puts their phone number in and they end up getting dozens of calls from dozens of different companies, whether it's an auto insurance company, whether it's a company that's making a warm transfer to that auto insurance company, whether it's just a lead generator who's, who's trying to test out if it's a lead aggregator doing the outbound calling. The idea here is that the FCC wants to say, if somebody's putting their phone number into a list, that doesn't give omnibus free for all consent for, for everybody to call them over every, every purposes for any purpose. I, I think, as you can see here, the FCC's proposed rules intent is, um, is to prevent lead generate companies from over obtaining consent. And we've talked about this forever. This, this is in line with the TCPA generally, which is somebody should be receiving the messages and the phone calls that are reasonably aligned or aligned with their reasonable expectations of what they're going to receive, right? If I put my phone number into a list or into a website, about auto insurance, I might not expect to receive a phone call about, um, um, you know, a, a new sale going on about blazers that I that I might be interested in a store. So th the idea is trying to limit it so that people aren't getting overly burdened by a bunch of phone calls when they're not. The issue here, though, is whether or not the the FCC's rulemaking would completely close the idea of having lead generators work work at all if you can even use a lead generator so this all started in december or most recently started in december where fcc issued a ruling that a lead gener generation website didn't clearly and conspicuously disclose the entities from which consumers agreed to receive phone calls because the form said you received um you agree to receive communications from hyperlinked marketing partners and that um hyperlinked to a second website with a list of over five thousand names and the fcc said no 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 this isn't sufficient to demonstrate that the called parties consented to the calls from any individual marketing partner let alone all five thousand so the consent was in invalid from the get the uh the other thing that the fcc's uh notice of proposed rulemaking would do is potentially require that consent can only be provided directly to one entity at a time and directly to the entity that would be making the calls. Now, if you think about it, what that means is even if you have a, 
not even a lead generator, just somebody out there who's operating their own web form, who's only doing services for one company. Uh, I'm running a web form promoting Ellen's company and somebody comes in and gives me consent. And then is that consent given directly to Ellen? And the FCC's notice of proposed rulemaking might go very, very far by saying, no, 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 that consent needs to be given directly to Ellen. It's not enough that Shaheen receives a consent and then transferred it to, to Ellen. And what we saw recently too is a, a bunch of state attorney generals actually submitted comments in response to this. And they say that consent under the TCPA is between one specific consumer and one specific seller. And they say that the plain language of the existing rules make clear that this is the intent under the FCC. So the question here now is that the state AGs in those states want the FCC to codify what has already exists. And I don't agree with that position necessarily. Now in that, the F the state AGs cited the Federal Trade Commission's guidance concerning the telemarketing sales rule. We've had some questions pop up about this. The FTC will periodically change its questions and answers and guidance for business. And it'll do so sometimes quite surreptitiously so that you go to their website and it looks like there's new law there. And one of the things that the FTC has on its guidance is that a consumer's agreement with a seller to receive calls delivering pre-recorded messages is non-transferable. So now all of a sudden, beginning in May, that language is on the FTC's uh, Q&A guidance for telemarketers. And the state AGs looked at that and said, hey, look, the FTC is saying this too. So we, I don't know that we've really seen that enforced yet by the FTC. I think that whatever the FCC does with the rule will help all of us know what the FTC will do with it on the T TSR side. But those two agencies don't always agree. So again, we're, we're at a, in a wait and see uh, um, position as well. Now, uh, the FCC also issued a final rule targeting and limiting unlawful text messages. And this would require, or this requires mobile wireless providers to block text at the network level on a reasonable do not originate list. And that includes numbers that purport to be from invalid, unallocated, or unused North American numbering plan numbers, and numbers for which the subscriber to the number requested that text purporting to originate from that number be blocked. So as you can imagine now, the FCC is imposing a requirement that the providers essentially block um, text messages. And now you have these providers who have to make decisions about what text messages to block and what not to block. Now, as you can also imagine, that's going to result in a bunch of calls or, or excuse me, a bunch of text messages that are legitimate that still get blocked inadvertently because you have a wireless provider trying to comply with this. So what the FCC tried to do to solve for that issue is requiring mobile wireless providers and other entities to maintain a point of contact for texters to report erroneously blocked texts. We'll see how this is going to work, but I have a sneaking suspicion that this is going to lead to a lot of mischief and trouble across the board, both on the, um, on the challenges side and both on companies who say that their text messages were improperly blocked and also putting um, wireless providers maybe not in the best uh, position for this. The other thing too is that this calls for clarification that the do not call registry protections uh, prohibiting marketing communications to registered numbers also apply to text messages. We have seen some courts say that and that the national do not call registry under the text of the statute only applies to uh, residential phone numbers. And so companies will say, well, a cell phone is not a residential uh, phone number. And some courts have agreed with that, that defendants have raised. Uh, but a lot of courts are saying, no, no, the do not call registry protections apply to residential phone numbers and your cell phone can be a residential phone number. Really, residential just means it's not a business uh, phone number. So the FCC wants to clarify this. They, FCC, I think, is saying essentially that that's been their position all along. Let's just get this in, a, in its own rule saying that so that we don't have courts coming out diverging ways. Hmm. The FCC's notice of proposed rulemaking strengthening consumer protections uh, against unwanted robocalls robo would um, require that company specific do not call and revocation of consent re requests must be honored within 24 hours of receipt. So a lot of times we have clients come to us and say, well, we honor people's do not call requests, but sometimes we get them in one way, or sometimes we have multiple telemarketers or we'll receive them. We have to transfer that to the telemarketer. How much time do we have to honor that? If somebody says, do not call me, does that mean from that second on we can never call them or do we have a period of time to honor that? And until 
for now, at least, the, the rule is that you have a reasonable amount of time to honor the do not call, but in no event longer than 30 days. That leaves it then up to the really courts to decide what is a reasonable period of time. And with the, um, the increases in technology and advances in technology, you can imagine that people are now saying that this should be happening very quickly. And the FCC's proposal here embodies that, the idea that the do not call and revocation of consent requirements need to be honored within 24 hours of receipt. You can't take two weeks and continue to call or text somebody while you're uh, processing that. It would also codify the FCC's ruling that consumers can revoke consent under the TCPA through any reasonable means. And what that would mean is that you, you really have to let people revoke their consent in various different ways. A lot of times people will say that the only way you can revoke your consent is by texting these specific uh, code, only stop to this short code, and that's the only way you can revoke consent. I think the FCC wants to make it easier for people to opt out and express a preference not to receive marketing messages from people. It also proposes to codify the FCC's ruling that texters can send a one-time text message converting, confirming the revocation of consent, as long as it only confirms that revocation and doesn't include any additional marketing and promotional information. There's another question that comes up a lot. Somebody opted out. Can I just send them a quick text message confirming that they opt out? Because sometimes we have class action plaintiffs will say, ha, huh, you sent that other, that other text message after they revoked consent. That's liability, $1,500. Here we go. And what the FCC's ruling would say would, would be that, no, no, you can, you can confirm that consent, but you have to do it um, only confirming the consent. You can't do it in a way that says that rebuttal that Ellen was talking about earlier. Hey, uh, okay, we've opted you out, but are you sure? Maybe you want to come back and talk to us a little bit more. The FCC would say no. Litigation trends and examples. We talked a little bit earlier about the Oklahoma Telephone Solicitation Act that passed a couple of years ago. The first lawsuit was filed under that uh, Telephone Solicitation Act, and it actually was filed about a week before the Florida amended uh, bill went into that was signed by a Florida class action plaintiff's attorney. So what really happened was that the legislator in Florida said that we we're going to make this law a lot more difficult for people to sue under. They sent it to uh, DeSantis and then class action plaintiff's attorneys realized what was going on uh, in Florida. So they pivoted. And so we saw the first lawsuit being filed under the OTSA. And that lawsuit alleges that the defendant used an automated system for the selection or dialing of telephone numbers or the playing of recorded message um, to make sales calls. So what that, uh, what that company had done, it was an online platform, a selling platform, and it sent the plaintiff probably, I think, 10 or 20 text messages with promo, promo codes and things like that. Whenever you're sending a lot of text messages <laughs> to anybody, uh, your, your liability is going to increase. Volume is quite often the, uh, the highest indicator of, of risk in this area. Uh, in that case, though, the defendant used a short code telephone number to send text messages to the plaintiff. And the plaintiff said, well, I can't use that short code telephone number to connect to the defendant. I, I can't call that number back, which by its nature, short code is typically, that's what you can't, you can't do that. And so that's uh, allegedly in violation of the OTSA. Uh, again, the 8, 8 a.m., 8 p.m. local time zone, we're seeing a lot of those. Uh, keeping an eye out, making sure that you're staying within the, the time zone requirements, that the defendant made more than three commercial telephone solicitation calls on the same issue within 24 hours. And there was a little uh, TCPA claim just thrown in there too, saying that um, the company uh, called people whose telephone numbers were registered on the national do not call registry. So um, we'll see where that one goes. We'll see what Oklahoma courts say on um, the exemption and whether or not there's an existing business relationship, or if there was any relationship, I, I don't know. Here are some class action trends. This echoes what Ellen said earlier. Um, we're seeing a decrease in uh, lawsuits alleging consent, but those do not call violations are increasing. Pre-recorded calls have always been dangerous, but now they're a lot um, they're a lot more tempting for people to sue under, and also state telemarketing laws. So let's talk about the continuing auto dialer cha uh, challenges because we've we've taken the position now that the Supreme Court has basically eviscerated any lawsuit that can be filed under the federal TCPA alleging that the defendant called somebody using an automated telephone dialing system. Because in order to be an automated telephone dialing system, you have to meet these very specific requirements of randomly selecting and dialing. Um, phone calls or phone numbers. Now, in this case, though, this was a motion to dismiss, and the plaintiff alleged that an ATDS was used to call him in connection with collecting an alleged debt. 
And the plaintiff said, well, I don't know what dialing system was used, but it was an automated telephone dialing system. And the court uh, looked at this and said, uh, where the called party is the intended recipient of a message, the, the auto dialer theory nor normally will not apply. And ATDS uses a random or sequ sequential number generator, and a caller would not use such technology to contact a specific person without a showing to the contractor. And I love this. I think mm -hmm. this is exactly right. Why would you be using a random or sequential number generator if you know who you're calling? And that's the language of the federal TCPA. And I think mm -hmm. this is a really great ruling and it's spot on. Mm -hmm. And the plaintiff didn't disagree. They said, "I yeah, okay, there's a debt there. And yeah, they called the right person. Um, he didn't say anything to say, no, I'm not, I wasn't the guy they were trying to call. They didn't have my number. They didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the other side though. We had another case where the court said the plaintiff did allege sufficient facts to show that the defendants used an ATDS. And in that case, the defendant said, well, we, we sent the text message from a preloaded list. So we did know who we wanted to text. And they're sort of almost making that targeted argument. The court said, no, there was at least an inference that they use an ATDS because the plaintiff never provided his phone number and has no relationship to the defendant. That's a little bit circular if you think about it, because, well, the plaintiff never gave consent. So therefore it was an ATDS. There's no relationship. Um, I, I don't know, but I think that these facts are really interesting. The court looked at these facts that the plaintiff alleged. Plaintiff received a high volume of text messages, each coming from a different number. He received text messages to someone named Adam, but his name wasn't Adam, or maybe he'd never gone by the name Adam. He received the te each text, even though he had not responded to any of the messages. He received many on the same day, he received them with a few hours of each other back to back. They were virtually identical. And the court said, look, the alleged volume, frequency, proximity, similarity, and absence of the plaintiff's response to those text messages raise a plausible inference that defendants use an ATDS. So if you think about that, I, I would say the volume probably went pretty far on that one. We're seeing an increase in do not call cases as well. So in, in this case, the defendant had a do not call policy that said that a caller may still call an individual on their do not call list if the individual had given their prior express written or prior express written consent. And the plaintiff alleged that, that DNC policy violated the TCPA because that consent exception was in, wasn't valid. And it didn't require the defendant to coordinate it, the, the different do not call list. So if you're calling somebody on the same behalf, you got to make sure that you're transferring those, you're sharing that suppression list, making sure that everybody's making the calls is suppressing those phone numbers. The court rejected the consent argument exception because the statute says, a, uh, an exemption to DNC, you can call somebody if they give you your consent, even after they put their phone number on the DNC. The idea is that subsequent consent overrides the previous request not to call them. But the court agreed with the plaintiff that the TCPA does require a coordination of various do not call lists. You can't, you can't have a do not call list that you don't share with anybody and just use somebody else to make a phone call to the same person, right? The next thing we're seeing is what injury is enough to bring a claim? This is a little bit more technical under the TCPA, but at base it comes down to this, is a text message that rings in the woods that nobody hears or worries about, is that, a, is that really, did it really happen? Is it really an injury? The idea is that plaintiffs can't sit by and just have their phone over here ringing and then bring class action lawsuits for millions and millions of dollars, even though they really didn't suffer any harm from it. And so we'd seen in Florida, the 11th Circuit previously had said the receipt of one text message wasn't enough to confer Article Three standing such that somebody could bring a case into federal court and um, have standing within federal court to, to sue. And now we're seeing that in Florida, a state court held that under Florida statute that even though the plaintiff received seven marketing text messages, he didn't adequately allege the injury rising from them. Um, the 11th Circuit's now backtracking a little bit. They're going to listen to hearings and they're going to hear whether a single me message can confer standing under the TCPA. So they're going to, they might end up walking back that idea of one text message that whether or not that brings, that brings some um, standing. It really, the question really remains is what injury is enough? If I get a text message while my phone's in airplane mode and it just pops in and didn't really bother me and just popped in with a couple of other texts I deleted, no problem, then is that injury? I don't know. We're also seeing challenges to session replay technology as wiretapping invasion of privacy laws. So what a lot of companies had done in the past was use various services to uh, ensure that they've got a token or a trusted form that shows what a plaintiff actually did on the on their on their website that they got consent. 
so that if a plaintiff sues them and says, here's my phone number, you can go back to the tech, the session replay technology, you can put in the phone number, you get the token, and you see the website as it was presented to the plaintiff. We've used those types of technologies in the past to defend against TCPA cases and ended up in full walkaways because they demonstrate basically unequivocally that somebody with a specific IP address on a certain day um, enter, put their information in. Plaintiffs are now saying that this software is the equivalent of recording or eavesdropping or wiretapping them, and therefore it's prohibited. This all started because somebody filed a TCPA lawsuit. The defendant said, no, 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 here's the evidence. And the plaintiff said, ha, no, you wiretapped me. And California's Invasion of Privacy Act provides for a private right of action and statutory damages. So we're seeing an incredible rise in those. So now we have to figure out um, what, how to really obtain consent to track website interactions. And this goes back, Ellen, exactly what you said. It's like, you have to get them to consent, uh -huh. to consent, uh -huh. to consent to the recording. It's like how many different layers of consent. Uh -huh. And I, I do think that there's, there's going to be a tipping point, just like we saw with the TCPA, where the Supreme Court said enough is enough. I imagine the same thing will happen here. Well, again, this is all wait and see, but it is something that if you're a company that is collecting consent online, then you should definitely be looking at the way you're you're collecting that consent, how you're um, taking um, your recordings of it, if you are, and what you're telling people about those recordings. The one thing too I'd say about CPA, the CEPA, is that if you're using chat boxes, we're also seeing lawsuits brought under chat boxes because, under the same sort of idea that you're um, recording chat box interactions without telling them, telling people that you're doing so. Let's talk quickly about ways to reduce uh, risk and what to do next. So continue to make the effort to comply with the prior express written consent stan stan standard. The, it, it, I expect there's going to be a fix. We've talked about this all the time. The question of whether or not people like unsolicited messages, it's not a political question. I, it's very hard for me to find anybody who says, yeah, I love getting um, random text messages on my phone call, on my phone. I, just, mm -hmm. I, I haven't met somebody, but maybe I don't have enough friends. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, um, so courts are still on, on the fence about motions dismissed over this auto dialer issue. I showed you two different examples. So prior, prior express written consent might be a wise strategy. You're going to have to weigh the business goals and what you know whether or not you want to have that language versus a potential risk and whether or not even if a court ultimately agrees with you whether you want to spend the legal fees time and business uh, distraction litigating it because even if a court ultimately agrees with you it's sometimes that whole motion to dismiss um they'll say no no we'll we'll let, we'll see how this this case plays out and then you're stuck in court for a year or so well you see how this plays out or you're stuck settling do not call list violations are still a potential claim and get consent. So if there are so many telephone numbers on the national do not call it, there's so many telephone numbers that it is, I believe, becoming a de facto standard that you need to obtain consent for any solicitation. I don't care how you're calling it. You've got somebody sitting there dialing the telephone numbers. More state laws are on the horizon. We're keeping an eye on them. So we'll keep you updated on our blog as well. Obtain consent for session replay technologies and don't neglect other technologies requirements. Be really clear on your scripting and disclosures, calling hours, registration, and entity specific do not call lists. And as we saw in the other case, um, making sure you coordinate it so that your affiliates are, are doing that, that as well. So here's our contact information. I know we had a couple of questions, but we're going to um, follow up with those questions afterwards. The uh, CLE code word is the um, telemarketing 2023. And if you have any questions, our contact information is here. Uh, thank you again, everybody for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing your questions and seeing where all this stuff goes next. Have a good afternoon.